gothic, a term that's become a household word, used to refer to everything from music and film, clothing and makeup. It's a genre, a style, and a descriptor, and more modern works are using the staples of the gothic as building blocks in their stories, their characters, and their settings. There are many video games that would qualify under the umbrella of gothic, but there are few that I can think of which so fully embrace the concept than the Devil May Cry series. But what is gothic really? What makes a story gothic? And how do those ideas translate into a video game like Devil May Cry? To find out, we must travel back to the 1700s and the genesis of the genre. In 1764, a novel was published that would become the beginning of a new genre of fiction. The themes and motifs already existed, but no one had blended them together quite like the Castle of Otranto, an anonymous novel purported to be a manuscript found abandoned in a crumbling castle in Italy, depicting the story of a noble family's descent into madness and ruin. It was actually written by Horace Walpole, a politician and nobleman with an obsession with the medieval. He even had a recreation of a medieval castle built for him to live in, and it was here that he first had the dream that would inspire Otranto. His story would include all the staples of the gothic genre that was to come. Mysteries, murder, secrets and portents, ghosts and the unexplained, and much more. It was melodramatic almost to the point of comedy, with characters fainting and crying at the drop of a hat. Its plot was convoluted and involved secret bloodlines and vengeance, prophecies and the forbidden. It was an immediate success. The second reprinting of the novel would add the subheading, A Gothic Story. The Goths were a group of ancient Germanic peoples who sacked Rome in the 400s. What in the world could they have to do with a literary genre in the 1700s? Nothing, really. The term Gothic was coined by an art historian as an insult. Since the Romans were the forebears of the modern Roman Catholic institution, the sacking of Rome was condemned as villainous and the Goths as backwards barbarians. So the term Gothic was used to refer to something barbarous and lacking culture. In this specific case, it was used to refer to medieval architecture, which wasn't built by the Goths. But the term stuck. The architecture became known as Gothic. It is this style that Walpole was obsessed with, the style he had his house built in, and the style of castle that his novel was set in. Thus began the new Gothic revival style of architecture that saw castles popping up across England, and alongside it, the Gothic literary genre was born. Of course, there were also real medieval ruins everywhere, especially ruins of religious institutions. When Henry VIII decided England was going to leave the Catholic Church, it led to the destruction of countless medieval churches, convents, and monasteries, which were left to dot the landscape as monuments to the past, a past considered more superstitious, barbarous, and dangerous. These ruins were a reminder of the transience of human lives. What had once seemed unchangeable and undefeatable was long gone. These were times of change and transition, of great wars and tragedies, the French and American revolutions, the end of imperialism, industrialization, the rise of modern political movements. Within the last few hundred years, all of these became part of Western culture and found their reflection in the stories of the Gothic. What was considered forbidden and impossible was becoming less so, and the Gothic pushed the envelope further, letting no topic be off limits, no sin unexamined, no dark shadow unexplored. At times reviled and at times incredibly popular, often both at once, the genre has remained strong and continues into the present day, and is large enough many subgenres have been developed to explore the different styles of Gothic that's emerged. In spite of the large varieties, however, there are still a number of themes and recurring motifs that define Gothic works. And the first is the setting. 
The Gothic setting for a novel is inevitably Gothic architecture. The ancient and crumbling ruins spread across Europe. As the centuries progressed, this setting would develop further, but the concept was the same. These novels were set in places of ruin and decay, physical reminders of the transience of life and inevitability of death, which the prose itself would reinforce. The settings are often ancient, associated with a lost time and place, and that fact is not lost upon the people living in it. Places associated with death and isolation were the most common. Graveyards, crypts, and morgues were all commonplace, with heavy focus upon the sense that one is surrounded by remnants of the dead. The locations weren't solely horrifying, however. There was often beauty to be found in these lonely, abandoned places. Spiraling staircases, high towers, dark, deep tunnels, and foggy forests. Places that leave one feeling off and confused, turned about and unsure of which way is up. Places that feel as if you aren't alone, though you very much are. Reminders of those who were here once before are all around, and you cannot escape the feeling that perhaps they are still here. As inspiration for the haunting castles and complex buildings of their stories, writers of the Gothic could look to the Gothic revival architecture. Since Walpole started the trend, many rich people of the time set about building their own fake ancient castles. The architects were encouraged to build more and more grandly, strangely, and ghoulishly, creating massive complex structures with hidden doors, traps, and secret tunnels. Gothic architecture is complex and incredibly detailed. It often lacks symmetry and seems to continue on and on. Tall, towering structures have to be supported with flying buttresses to keep buildings too high to stand on their own aloft. Heavily ornamental, with the appearance of a labyrinthine design that has no exit, the most important thing is the feeling of movement, the grandeur, the sense of scale and overwhelming power and size. The period of history these Gothic castles were associated with was viewed with horror and fascination by the modern populace. The medieval was a time of superstition and death, of brutal executions and wars, harsh laws and tortures. The sense of violence and death was very much part of the draw to Gothic structures, that they were once home to such horrors, and that these horrors had somehow become part of the structures themselves, the buildings a reminder of the sins of the past that still echo on in the present. This is a major theme in all the works of Gothic literature, the sense that the past haunts the present. The spirits of the dead return to haunt the living. Plots of revenge, ancient prophecies, the consequences of past actions, all these have a heavy focus in Gothic stories. It wasn't only your actions that had consequences, however. The actions of your family and your ancestors did as well. Many stories depend upon the past actions of a character's bloodline, leading them either to reclaim a lost heritage, or to lose everything because of past sins. In Varney the Vampire, the Bannerworth family is hunted by a vampire who is their own ancestor from a hundred years previous. The fall of the House of Usher is predicated upon the last of the Usher family believing his family is cursed and he fulfills said curse by his own frantic, maddened behavior. So we find the first most basic building blocks of a gothic novel are plain to see in Devil May Cry. The first game is set upon an island covered in gothic ruins, graveyards, haunted forests, and ghost ships, where the chapel is actually a door to hell when flipped upside down. The first three games follow this trend heavily, while the fourth tips into another hallowed Gothic tradition, the vilification of Catholicism and the use of its symbolism to refer to the demonic. Devil May Cry's protagonist is under a curse of his own, the last son of Sparta, who betrayed demonkind and chose to defend humanity. In doing so, he made many enemies who sought out his family and murdered them. Dante is all that remains, and his quest for vengeance informs the first game, and his role as a son of Sparta informs the rest. He is called to the island so Mundus may get his vengeance on Sparta's son for imprisoning him, and many demons in the castle are horrified by the knowledge that Dante is Sparta's kin, 
placing upon him a weight of destiny akin to a curse. The hero of the Gothic novel is a stranger in a strange land. Home is gone if it ever was, lost to an idyllic past, a bygone era that will never return. Feelings of isolation from the world, either by choice or by force, are strong. The protagonist is alienated from the world around them, which is itself an alien world, close enough to reality to be recognizable, but somehow off and wrong at the same time. Dante is a half-demon, one of the few, a man who has lost his family to murder. He has no true home and no true place in the world, caught between humans and demons and reviled by each. His past haunts every moment of his present, the loss of his family, the fight with his brother, constantly weighing upon him and informing his actions. He is also incredibly violent. Devil May Cry 4 paints a powerful picture of how this violence looks on the outside. As a demon, he is strong and capable of killing on a large scale, and he revels in it. This kind of anti-hero is common in gothic novels, which were happy to depict as their heroes, murderers and criminals of all kinds. Nero, too, follows the trends of the gothic hero. A gothic novel is rarely complete without the presence of the supernatural. That doesn't mean every gothic novel portrays magic and superstition as real, but the sense it might be real often haunts the story. But just as many gothic novels play the supernatural element straight, using ghosts, ghouls, vampires, and monsters as their antagonists. Paintings were suddenly suspect. Otranto involves a scene in which Manfred, the antagonist, believes he sees his grandfather's painted figure move on its own, and the picture of Dorian Gray is centered upon a pact that involves a magic portrait. The supernatural isn't always so clear-cut as a floating chair or a candle blowing out. It is vague and ephemeral, a sense of wrongness or otherworldliness that cannot be explained, something off and other about the location and the people in it. In Devil May Cry, that otherness is found throughout, from the first moment we see Dante walking around with a sword stuck through his chest. He fights puppets that can move, paintings that come to life, and statues that spring from the stone they sit upon, all incredibly gothic styles of monsters. Later games become more complex, from horrible rituals that summon hellish devices in three, much like the witch sabbaths of gothic tales, to the scientific experiments on demons in four that bring to mind later gothic novels like Frankenstein. But the true evil, the true monster behind the ghosts, is always power. Power is the ultimate enemy of any gothic story. The rich noble, the possessive father, the manipulative religious figure, the hungry monster. They all have in common power, and the ability to wield it upon others without constraint. This power is often associated with the higher classes, especially in later gothic fiction. It's no mistake that Virgil is characterized as a higher class than Dante. His fine clothes, his way of speaking and carrying himself, and the way he looks down on his brother all characterize him as a demon noble, and one who desires power more than anything else, like any good gothic villain should. Power in an abstract sense is also heavily influential, the horrible weather that traps the victim inside the haunted castle, the terrible storm that rocks the ship about the waves, the forces of nature and the supernatural coming together to threaten the hero. Gothic stories are known for their melodrama. Everyone is constantly feeling the heights of emotion, the greatest highs and lows, sorrows and joys. Emotion is what binds the story together, creating the sense of immediacy necessary to make the story matter. And oh boy, do these characters feel. They are constantly overwhelmed by emotions brought on by terror, sorrow, and delight. Women are most famous for fainting and even dying of emotion in these tales, but it happens to men too. In The Monk, multiple characters suffer physical illnesses due to emotional tragedies, in Frankenstein, the protagonist nearly has a fit at the idea that his creation might be nearby. Emotions are powerful enough to make grown men tremble and cry in fear, a trend that was very much against the social norm. 
The extremes of emotion in Gothic literature allowed for the exploration of feelings that were considered inappropriate, due to their intensity, or because they were being expressed by men, allowing male characters to weep and beat their breasts and howl at the death of one they loved. They were allowed to portray weaknesses and fears other genres would shy away from as unmanly. Devil May Cry is no stranger to extremes of emotion. In fact, it is entirely about extremes, taking what is normal to the next level. No one who hears it will ever forget that famous line. I should have been the one to fill your dark soul with light! light, light. Not to mention other incredibly melodramatic moments in the story throughout the series, in which characters violently and emphatically process high emotion, almost overreacting to the drama of the situation, with the strength of their feelings and their physical response to them. In fact, the focus on feelings that the entire series creates with its title is a way of admitting to the melodrama and embracing it. Nearly every game has Dante or Nero crying in it, and these displays of emotion are not portrayed negatively, comedically, or as a weakness. Though Dante attempts to say devils never cry multiple times, we obviously see that he, at least, does. This refusal to adhere to masculine traditions that restrict feeling is very gothic, as no true gothic work would be satisfied with the idea someone should not feel something. They should feel everything, and express it vividly and passionately. These extreme emotions call for extreme circumstances, and convoluted plot lines designed to make the characters lose their minds and their senses. One of the most common is the sudden reveal of a relationship that was previously hidden or unknown. In the castle of Ochanto, four times a mysterious relationship is revealed that changes the landscape of the story. Theodore, a poor young man, learns that the monk of the nearby chapel is his father, a fact that reveals the monk's formerly unmonkish ways. Later, Theodore learns that through his mother's side, he's descended from nobility and set to inherit the Lord's castle. If only the current owner, Lord Manfred, would stop trying to assault and murder everyone. During an attempt to protect Isabella, a princess from Manfred, Theodore hides her in a cave and stands watch. A knight approaches and demands to see her, and they fight, only for Isabella to run out and realize it was not a servant of Manfred, but her own father that had come to save her. And lastly, the jealous Manfred, believing that Isabella and Theodore are romantically involved, is driven to a murderous rage and sneaks up on the couple in the dark, stabbing the girl, only to find it was his own daughter Matilda that he'd murdered. Four times, the secret relationship of two characters redefines the story, and all four are related to bloodline and parentage. This trend would continue throughout Gothic literature. At the end of The Monk, for instance, the evil Ambrosio discovers that the women he's murdered were actually his sister and his mother. In the private memoirs and confessions of a justified sinner, the struggle between a pair of twin brothers separated at birth is the source of the story's drama. One of the boys, being brought up more religiously and strictly, becomes a monster who believes it is moral to kill the wicked, which leads him into conflict with his brother. The fall of the House of Usher deals with twins, too, and the implication of incest, as the house is one in which the family tree has never split, and the two siblings are sickly for no explained reason. The story ends with the sister buried alive by her brother, rising and killing him before dying herself, as the protagonist runs from the house and it crumbles into the lake below. Further explorations of these themes would develop into what would become known as the doppelganger, the idea that there is a copy or other self, another version of you in the world. In The Devil's Elixirs, a man finds out that a doppelganger of himself has been arrested for his crimes. He attempts to save the doppelganger, only for the doppelganger to turn around and murder his beloved. The extreme of this idea is Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, in which it is revealed that the innocent victim and murderous villain are actually the same person, inhabiting one body with two minds. Devil May Cry has countless examples of these themes being explored, the most obvious in Virgil and Dante. 
In the first game, the reveal that Nero Angelo was Dante's brother all along is the heart of the whole game. Trish, too, is a variation of this idea. We quickly realize she is a clone of Dante's mother. In the third game, Dante and Virgil's physical struggle is the center of the story. In addition, we meet Lady, and it is revealed that the central antagonist is her father. Of course, there's also Devil May Cry 5, where Nero spends half the game not realizing the enemy they're fighting is his father, and that Dante has been his uncle the entire time. The contest of brothers, of twins, runs through all the games. Two people so similar yet so different, a theme that gothic novels love to explore in detail. What makes a person, and what makes a monster? The circumstances of Dante and Virgil's childhoods create two very different people with different values, and the games further explore how these values place them at odds. You can consider their fights as a form of the doppelganger too. On the tower, Virgil's hair falls and he looks just like his brother until the end of the fight. There's also a boss fought on the same tower who looks just like Dante's Devil Trigger, and is called Doppelganger. To a certain extent, any of the fights between Virgil, Nero, and Dante are similar to the contest between selves that a doppelganger represents. They are all part human, part demon, similar in appearance, but with very different backgrounds and beliefs that clash in combat. Another major feature of the Gothic is the danger posed to women. The monster haunting the castle almost inevitably goes for the women first. This would change as female authors took the genre by storm, centering the stories on the women themselves, but nevertheless, gothic novels are often centered on women as symbols, as representations of good that must be protected. To heighten the evils of the antagonist, the story presents a character who is beyond reproach, a pious and gentle innocent who knows little of the world, who represents everything the protagonist is trying to protect from harm. Sometimes they succeed, often they do not. These women are often threatened sexually and emotionally by male characters, and even tempted by them. During the era of the Gothic, the early feminist movements and the fight for women's rights were all rising steadily, and the new woman was on the rise. Gothic fiction, ever ready to expand definitions and defy borders, often embraced these women, especially when it was women themselves writing the novels. But the fear that women were changing, that society was moving towards more sexual freedom, was built deep into the Gothic genre, and many of these novels reflected that fear back at the audience, horrifying them with the idea that good English women might be being ravished. To a certain extent, all the DMC games involve women in danger. But the best representation of a gothic woman is Kyrie, a young woman who is more symbol than personality, a perfect representation of what is considered good and holy. And she is quickly placed in danger, making the evils of the cult more prominent and the stakes of Nero's quest far higher. Kyrie has no violent tendencies and is probably the only normal character of the games. She represents everything good in the world, a symbol to be protected against evil. Sex and romance are inevitably part of the Gothic, but often these are tragic and doomed lovers, and the hint of the sexual in the enemy that is being faced, something almost tempting or desirable about the monster. These are stories about heroes overcoming temptations that represent moral struggles, which at the same time present the audience with the chance to enjoy the struggle, gasping lips and heaving breasts without shame. That's the contradiction at the heart of so many gothic novels. What it often appears to condemn, it aims to provide by giving a moral sheen to a sexual, violent, depraved story. This appearance of morality went beyond typical sexuality and involved any and everything forbidden. Orgies, female and male homoeroticism, inverted gender roles, characters pretending to be other genders, incest, sexual assault, and necrophilia. All of these, and more, can be found in the Gothic. Often portrayed as sinful and the acts of the monstrous, at the same time, betraying their sympathies for said monsters in the way the story is presented, and how these scenes are meant to titillate the audience. The opening of Varney the Vampire involves a young woman sleeping in her bedchamber. 
and the author lovingly describes her beauty and her vulnerability. These voyeuristic scenes are common, scenes in which the reader is presented with an everyday scene which becomes sexually appealing when we are given access to it. The sexual scenes are both thrilling and horrifying. In Dracula, Jonathan writes of his encounters with three vampire women with both horror and wonder. He almost wanted them to take his blood, even as he feared they would, and they only stop when Dracula enters, declaring he is mine. Homosexuality haunts the tale, as it did much of the Gothic in the 1890s. This was the era of the trial of Oscar Wilde, the famous writer who himself wrote the Gothic tale of the picture of Dorian Gray. He was accused, tried, and condemned for homosexuality, during a trial that was wildly sensationalized and made famous. Bram Stoker was his friend. Female homosexuality is even more common and overt, going much farther back, especially in titillating French Gothic novels. The vampire story of Carmilla involves the vampiric woman feeding upon the human girl she loves but cannot stop destroying. Sexuality in the Gothic is violent, frightening, dangerous, immoral, and often inhumane. It involves monsters and unnatural desires, associates violence and force with seduction and sexuality. And so too does Devil May Cry, and it does so in a very similarly voyeuristic style. The more sexual, suggestive scenes of Devil May Cry are often presented with one character on screen. It's almost always just Dante by himself. There are scenes that come later that introduce far more dramatic presentations and even fourth wall breaking references, such as when Dante recites lewd poetry and dances for you, the player, while no one else is there. These scenes are incredibly homoerotic for two reasons. The fact that Dante is being presented to a presumed male audience, and the fact that he keeps being penetrated, all the time, with his own enormous sword. The violence of these scenes is part of the sensuality. Dante drags himself off his sword slowly and tentatively. We see how it empowers and is tamed by him. In the third game, the man spends the game half naked, showing off his new weapons when he obtains them. The scene with Nevin hints at the dangerous sexuality of monsters, which all these characters are, lest we forget. Dante is not human, and it is his inhumanity that is part of his draw which is why his sexual presentations are often associated with his power. He defeats an enemy, becomes more powerful, and revels in a sexual manner while doing so. Devil May Cry 4 has many scenes like this, in which his power and sex appeal are at full throttle during battle with hideous creatures. 5 has a scene in which Dante dances after obtaining a new weapon, and the dance, being Michael Jackson's moonwalk, is both associated with homosexuality and involves a close-up of Dante grabbing his crotch. This presentation of sexuality is something violent and monstrous, yet still desirable, as something presented for the audience rather than as a part of the story, and as something that blends genders and desires, that has no boundaries and no borders, is all very gothic. There is nothing forbidden, nothing too strange or too inhumane. This goes even further when you consider the actual romantic relationships of the story. The first game implies something romantic between Dante and Trish, and Trish is a clone of his mother. Nero and Kyrie are actually brother and sister. He was adopted by her family and raised with her, making their relationship a pseudo-incestuous one. Not to mention the homoerotic tones of many of the fights Dante engages with against his own family. This scene, in which Nero wraps his legs around Dante's waist and then puts his gun in his mouth, is over-the-top eroticism. It's all theater, all performance. Further presentation for the audience of something forbidden and titillating that has no bearing on the story. There is so much of the gothic to be found in Devil May Cry. It's fascinating to see how a literary style hundreds of years in the making has evolved and become part of a new medium. But what's most interesting is what is not gothic about this tale. Devil May Cry presents us with all the settings, all the trappings of the gothic story, and a character who feels no fear at all. We are presented with hell and the underworld, with ghosts and monsters, and Dante is never once afraid, turning the gothic on its head. 
we get to play as someone who is truly powerful, overwhelming, and unafraid of the nightmares before him, allowing us too to borrow his courage and play through these horrifying gothic tales with a smile and a laugh. <laughs>